Guys, all the cars that you see in these videos are for sale on my website, www.woodsandbarclay.com. Enjoy the video. Hey everyone, welcome back to the series on the 1983 300D. This is the car with 45,000 miles on it. Uh, it's officially the nicest condition 300D that I've ever seen. So I've already finished uh, the small amount of work that I found that needed to be done on the vehicle and I just wanted to review that with everyone. So let's go ahead and dive in here. Okay, so the first thing you're gonna notice is I installed a brand new AC compressor and belt. Uh, and if we go over here uh, to this side, and we'll see this from the top, that is a brand new uh, receiver dryer with new AC switches. So the AC has been recharged with new components and it works perfect. We'll lower it down and look at the uh, AC receiver dryer up top after I finish the undercarriage. So as far as the suspension goes, guys, I could not find a single problem with any of the suspension except for the ball joints. Uh, the boots were ripped on the ball joints. So I installed brand new ball joints. You can see one there and one there. Now, the brakes work absolutely fine. They only have 45,000 miles on them. But just for safety, uh, I went ahead and replaced all of the brake hoses. You can see a brake hose there. On the front and rear, I did this. And a brake hose here. I mean, you can still see factory markings on these, uh, on these brakes. And they work fantastic. No reason to change anything else on the brakes. Um, I've also removed uh, the wheels. And I put in um, new uh, bearing seals and repacked the bearings because it just had the original grease in there. Uh, so that's been taken care of. Now, if we go back here to the back of the vehicle, uh, you can see I put in a new brake hose back here. And I also pressure washed under the vehicle. Now, sometimes I will refinish uh, the original suspension. But this is a basically a museum quality vehicle. You can still see a lot of the original factory paint is still on the vehicle. Um, I did not want to repaint or refinish that in the semi-gloss black uh, just because that's original, guys. And this is a 45,000-mile car, and it's in immaculate condition. You can see the paint is still even up on the uh, axles. And so I, I don't want to repaint over that. I want that to stay original. One thing I'm going to do today, uh, on, upon further inspection, I see the... Uh, boots right here on the sway bar end links. Let's see if I can get up in there. There we go. So there's a boot that covers up that ball joint there. Uh, and that boot is ripped off. So I'm going to go ahead and replace these original sway bar end links. But guys, that is it for the underside of this vehicle. There's absolutely nothing else that needs to be done. It is awesome condition. I already went out and test drove it. And it drives like a new 300D. So, or it drives like a, a 300D. If I were to replace all the suspension, that's what it feels like. So anyway, let me go ahead and lower this back down. And we'll show you up top uh, the new receiver dryer and AC switches. And then we're going to move to the Hirschman antenna. So I did notice, there you, go, you can see the Hirschman antenna back here. I did notice the radio works, but that antenna does not go up and down. So today, that's what we're going to work on. We're going to restore that Hirschman antenna, and we're going to replace the rear sway bar end links. Let me go ahead and show you the new AC components up here. All right, guys, as you can see, this is uh, absolutely remarkable, uh, the condition of this vehicle. That, that's original. Um, I mean, let me know if you've ever seen a 300D like this, because that's absolutely incredible. But over here, uh, what I wanted to show you is the new AC components we installed here. There we go. That's a new receiver dryer with uh, a new temp switch and, and pressure switch. Um, this is what controls the auxiliary fan on the front of the car. This keeps the moisture out of the AC system. Uh, and I think that's a pressure switch that uh, kicks off the compressor if too much pressure builds in the system. Um, and again, you can see the... From the top down, you can see the new compressor that we installed right there. Uh, so today, like I said, we're going to work on the Hirschman antenna. There are the replacement sway bar end links, and you can see 
See how it has that protective boot right there that covers the ball joint, and that's disintegrated on the ones on this car. So I'm gonna go ahead and replace those. But for now, let's go ahead and get this original Hirschman antenna out of the car. Okay, back here in the trunk, these are all the uh, service and repair manuals that the previous owner had printed out. I'm just leaving those all back here. And there's, uh, I think, one of the floor mats. But to remove the Hirschman antenna, first, we have to remove this panel right here so we can get access to it. All right, there we go. So first thing I see here, this is the sunroof, uh, the cable that the sunroof retracts into or the housing. So I'm gonna go ahead and just pop that off of there, just like that. And then we can get this plastic uh, inner fender liner out of here. And it simply slips over that, that's the uh, power for the trunk light that goes here. We'll slip that out of its holder. And then this just simply folds over like that. And there we go. There is our original Hirschman antenna. And guys, let me just show you how remarkable condition this vehicle is. What you see uh, back here, that's all the original Cosmoline wax that uh, was sprayed in from the factory. They sprayed it, I guess, up in that area here. And you can see it's all down in this area here. And you can see the Hirschman antenna is remarkable condition. So I'm sure it's something stupid, like maybe a uh, the mast just needs to be replaced. So I'm gonna go ahead and get this out of here. Okay, so to get this antenna out, first thing we do, we just want to unplug the power right there. Okay, to remove the antenna, we have to get the chrome, uh, I guess, antenna bezel off. And you have to have a special tool that goes around it and locks into these two slots and turns. Or you can just be very careful and just go like that with a flathead screwdriver. And we can slowly spin it off there. Uh, just be careful. You don't want to damage anything. You don't want to slip and like gouge your paint. And we're just tapping very lightly, guys. And in a minute, it's going to loosen up and we can finish it by hand. All right, there we go. Now it's loose enough to finish by hand. And there we go. We can screw off the, the cap there. There you go, there's the, uh, see the little, well, I'll see if it'll focus. There you go, see the little notches? That's what we were tapping in right there. And you can see, there's no damage. You just have to be delicate. Now, once that's out, you can then slip the antenna down uh, through there. So we have to first undo, we have to first undo that Phillips uh, right there so let's go ahead and do that okay i'm going to go ahead and undo this phillips right here and then that antenna will fall down here we go let's pull it through there there we go now we can get access to unscrew hopefully you guys can see that to unscrew the antenna And there we go, we just pull that out. And there we go. There's the Hirschman antenna. So let's get this over on the bench. We're gonna open it up and we'll see what the problem is. I bet it's just a broken antenna mast cable. Now this chrome bezel actually is free to be removed from the car now, but it's been on there for 40 years and it's not moving. Um, so I don't want to bother removing that. I'd like it to stay in the exact same place. And here's one of the things I like about the, you know, 82, 83 cars. Look at that. It's a nice metal housing Hirschman antenna. In 84, 85, they changed to these cheaper plastic housings and way more complex internal parts. They even put a circuit board and you don't have any of that crap in here. But let me go ahead and uh, show you the difference on the bench. All right, guys, let's go ahead and open up this antenna. And pretty easy. You 
just take out these four screws and then we can see what's going on inside there okay set that aside there so the first thing i can see guys is this looks fantastic um, there's still the factory original grease right there uh there uh, that looks brand new that's what it would look like when it's brand new this has never been open we still have the some grease down here so we're going to go ahead and get power applied and see if we can operate this on the bench Okay, guys, I have my 12 volt jump box over here. Yeah, you guys can see it down here. This is just a, you know, to jump a car battery. It's 12 volts. And we have six pins right here on the Hirschman connector. Let me point it out here because hopefully the antenna is going to go that way. And so we, we put our ground to pin six. I know you guys can't see it, but there's little numbers. Our ground to pin six, which is this, uh, green one right here and then our power to pin three and then you notice i have this jumper it's also connected to pin six and we're going to touch that to pin two and this thing should open up okay it started to go and then it got stuck you see how it just got stuck there so if we retract it Okay, guys, this is simple. Uh, that is just a broken antenna mast. Um, the little plastic cable in here can break. So we're just going to go ahead and replace that antenna mast. And to do that, we need a 13 millimeter. I've already gotten it started. And you can just screw off the, uh, the end here. And remove this. There we go. Now I'm going to try to extract it. All right, I'll go ahead and put it back down. Let's see if we can get it out. There we go. Whoops. <laughs> go back out. Okay, there we go. Okay, let's see what's going on with this mast. You know what? There is nothing wrong with this mast. It needs to be lubricated. That's what the problem is. Yeah, this mast works perfectly fine. It's just a little sticky, a little gummy. Oh, there we go. Might be stuck. Nope, there we go. That's fully extended right there. Okay, you know what, guys? I'm going to clean this mast up with... Uh, acetone and then I'm going to re-grease it and see what that does for us. Guys, that's all it was. I went ahead and I wiped off all the old uh, lubrication from here. I wiped it off with acetone and then I just applied some good sewing machine oil and look at this. This antenna works perfectly fine now. It was just gummed up from years of, uh, it just had all the old original grease on it. Uh, so we're just going to go ahead and feed this back in there and this antenna is going to work just fine. Yeah. So I'm going to go ahead and uh, remove this little lock nut here and take this uh, mast housing out. All right, here's going to be a better view for you guys. But what we're trying to do, we have to get the mast back down in here and then it has to poke through right here. And this is where it wraps around. Um, and we got to get it through a little hole right there. And it's almost impossible to do that without taking this uh, housing off. So we're going to undo this lock nut right here. And then this can spin off. All right, there we go. Now, see how we're now free to see this area down here. I've removed that, that tube. And then, 
And that's the reason it's so difficult is these are coiled up from they all they're from years they've been wrapped around the winding and they're always coiled up. They're like that when you get them new, the replacements. Um, that's why it makes it so difficult to feed it in here because it immediately wants to curve, you know, and go to one side when you stick it down in there. All right, let's see if I can demonstrate this. Okay, see how it wants to shoot out the side there? We have to get it right down to go in that hole there. Okay, so we got it in there, but it has to come through this little tip here, and the hole, guys, is like that big. So this sometimes takes a minute. There we go, I got it. Now what you can see, there you go. See the little, the little tip sticking through right there, that little plastic tip. Now we want to feed that, right? It's gotta go, there we go. It's gotta get in between this tensioning wheel here. There we go. Right there, okay, perfect. So now we need to make the antenna retract. But first I wanna go ahead and screw this mast housing back in there. Then we're gonna put that lock nut, we'll tighten that thing back down. But right now I want to uh, make the antenna retract. Yeah, I'm gonna stand out here and I'm gonna feed the mast in into the uh, housing. There it goes. Okay, we need to get it a little bit more. All right, now I need to get it to retract a little more. I gotta flip that switch there. There we go, one more. And bam, there we go, guys. So what I was doing, this is the little shutoff. It's like a, a gear that spins and it flips a little contact here as that's here. Let's see if I can zoom in and show you guys that. Okay. See these little teeth right here? As they spin, they flick up on that contact. This is a contact right here. And uh, as it spins... Once it gets around to the right tooth, which is that one, it clicks up on that and tells the motor to shut off. So I was manually flicking it to tell the motor to continue. That's just a really basic explanation. All right, you can see we got our mast all the way back down in here. I'm gonna screw this down. And then we want to try to uh, retract it. Actually, I'm gonna put a little bit of grease on there before we do that. All right, that's all we need. Here we go, re-greased that worm gear in pin two. There we go, look at that. We are back in business. All it needed was lubrication. All right, this is just some acetone on a rag. Just making sure it's perfectly clean. Here we go, see all that? gunky grease that came off of there. All right, now let's get this lubricated. Just a little here. Doesn't take much, guys. Then we're gonna rub this in. All right.
Perfect. All right, let me disconnect all this. And gonna retighten our lock nut here and we're gonna get this back in the car. Guys, on a little side note, I wanted to show you the difference between, see this is a nice metal housing 83 model that we just worked on. This is what they changed to in like 84, 85. Um, see you have this crappy plastic housing that has these little tabs you gotta crack off of there. And then on the internal components, they added this circuit board up here. And this circuit board actually has some microchips on it and capacitors and these things are notorious for failing. Um, you can just tell, see how the motor is much smaller compared to the 83 we just worked on. Uh, that's one of the reasons, like I always talk about 83 is my favorite model, 82, 83. The earlier cars were just built a little bit better in certain areas. Okay, I'm just gonna loosely reinstall everything. I'm not gonna crank back down our cap on the top um, because we just wanna test everything under the car's own power. Notice I haven't put the cap back on because we might have to take it back out in case we need to do more work. I'll do that in a minute. But let's go ahead, see if we got this thing working again. Oh, also what I'm gonna do today is re-glue that wood trim right there. It's inevitable that stuff comes loose after 40 years. All right, let's turn on the radio, put the antenna up. And there we go, guys. We have a working antenna. Go ahead and turn it off. Yep, and it's retracting correctly. Let's try to uh, do half mast. Abortion bands. It should come up like there we go. Comes up halfway. And now I'm gonna try to manually put it up. All right, I stopped like three quarter way maybe. There we go. Let's try to manually retract it. All right, that should be like three quarter mast. Okay, our manual controls are working. I'll go down a little bit more. Yep, see how it retracted just a little bit more. Just making sure we're shutting correctly here. There we go. Good. Okay, guys, that's mission accomplished. This antenna is back in business. So let's go ahead and put our cap back on here. And then let's go work on the uh, sway bar end links. Guys, these antennas can be finicky when they get old. We just basically disassembled that, re-greased it, and put it back together, and it started working again. Um, and, you know, if something like that happens again, hopefully after watching this video, you can see how easy it is to remove, open it up on the bench, and uh, just re-grease or clean some things. Uh, but they're very high quality, and they don't just, like, break internally, if you know what I mean. Sometimes they do, but it's rare. They're very, very well built. All right, so we're gonna take our sunroof line here and clip it back into the little clip here. There we go. And that is supposed to be like that. There we go, guys. And that's how you get a Hirschman antenna working again. Okay, before I put it up in the air to change the sway bar end links, I want to go ahead and start uh, removing the oil filter because I want to do an oil change. You can see the brake fluid is fresh from where I flushed it uh, to put the new brake lines on. Let me just check the power steering here. Oh yeah, that's like factory fresh. No reason to flush that. The coolant's fresh. Gunner, uh, had meticulously serviced this vehicle. Let me just do a quick check on the transmission fluid. Just make sure it's bright red. Oh yeah, there's absolutely no need 
to change the transmission fluid. Um, I'm just going to do the oil just because I don't know when it was changed and you should do that every 3,000 miles. So let's go ahead and get started on that. Guys, this is the most beautiful original engine I've ever seen on one of these cars. Even the oil filter housing lid uh, bolts still have zinc dichromate plating on them. There's our filter cap. And as I show in all my videos, guys, I like Hanks. This, this is a good company. They're German. They make good stuff. Uh, but there's our new filter. And you can see there's our O-ring for the housing, uh, the lid. And then there's our crush washer for the drain plug. And it's pretty simple, guys. You just remove your old O-ring from the housing, uh, from the lid right there. I got a little oil in my cap right there. I just put my fingers in it and run it around there. All right. And we'll take our filter. And let's go ahead and uh, put this back in the car. Now on these uh, 300Ds, Sometimes it's a little tricky. See this hose? This is, uh, I think that's one of your uh, heater core hoses. You got to clear that when you're putting in the filter. And sometimes that thing will get in the way of the cap. Pull our vacuum lines out of the way. Then you always got to fight with that guy back there. There we go. There we go. We got it around it. Now, we'll put our nuts back on here. Guys, you only torque these to like 10 foot pounds. Don't crank them down because they're being screwed onto studs. And if you crank this down, you will pull the stud out. It will not seal correctly. And you'll blow all the oil out of your oil filter housing lid. We'll just snug these back down. And that's it guys you just snug it up all right let's get this thing up in the air and uh, drain the oil 13 millimeter let me get my drain pan all right and while that's draining um, you want to replace the crush washer right here on the drain plug see that crush washer it's a copper crush washer and with every oil filter hankston man at least uh, they send you a replacement there it is right there so we'll put that on there and that'll go back on the car All right, let's fill this thing back up with oil and then go do the sway bar end links. All right, guys, like you've seen all the videos, I use Rotella T4 15W40. It's just good old heavy-duty diesel engine oil. Nothing special here. This is just a really good brand. And change your oil every 3,000 miles. We're going to go ahead and uh, we'll fire up the engine, let that circulate around, and then let it sit for about 10 minutes, and then check our levels and see how much we have to top it off. What I have also done that I forgot to show is I installed the newer updated Bosch primer pump here. So that's the pump that, see it right down there? You can pump that 
uh, when, when you uh, change a fuel filter or you change a pre-filter, you pump that to get diesel back up in the lines and the original ones leak. Let me show you an original one. This is the one that was removed from the car. Yeah, there we go. These are the original ones right here. And you actually unscrew the cap in order to get it to the pump. But you see there's a little O-ring, that black O-ring under there. And those will leak. Um, they'll just start leaking because they're old and those O-rings won't seal. So I go ahead and replace those with this, uh, with this new improved Bosch version. Thomas, you're going to have to move. Move out of the way. So, move, Thomas. So, guys, in order to change the rear sway bar in lengths, we need to go ahead and remove the back wheels. Okay, to get off these sway bar in lengths, we just take a, I think that's a 17 millimeter nut there. We take it off on this side. And then we come around the back side here and we put a wrench on the nut there that screws into the backing plate and we go ahead and unscrew that and then we can replace that. All right, we got that one off and let's go around the other side and remove it from the backing plate. That's kind of a tough shot guys, but you get a wrench back here. And my wrench is shaved down a little bit. See, I shaved it down so it'll fit back in here. And then you can just slowly, there you go. You just slowly unscrew that until you get it out of here. All right, we have the old original sway bar end links off of there. And these guys were actually still working, but I'm having a hard time finding much to do on this vehicle. And here's an item that I found. You see the boot is uh ripped off there and you see these still have the these have nice new boots on them so let's get these new ones on the car and these should last you know hundred thousand miles okay there we go we have our new sway bar in links installed and i was also checking the brakes back here there's actually brand new uh brake pads back here so don't even need to change the brake pads on this car but uh, i'm going to go ahead and check the front brake pads too Now, as I said, we've already uh, repacked the bearings uh, and put new seals and re-greased uh, the bearings. Yeah, there's, uh, there's nothing to do with the brakes, guys. The rotors are perfectly fine. No lip on the rotor, plenty of thickness left. And our brake pads are, you can see how thick they are right there. It's like three quarter life left. There's not even a need to change the brake pads on this car. All right, I'll get it back on the ground and we'll torque uh, the lug bolts here. But let's go, uh, go ahead and check our oil level now. Guys, this is simply one of the most well cared for babied vehicles I have ever seen. Well, it is the one. It is the most well cared for 300D I have ever seen. Period. All right. We're just below the bottom line. So let's go ahead and put in another, another quart or so, and then we'll be good. All right, guys, but we're going to be good right there. All right, guys, let's wait for that oil to settle down. Then we're going to check our level again. And in the meantime, let's go fix the small piece of uh, wood that started to delaminate from the dash. Now, let me show you what I used to do this. This stuff, I've tried all kinds of stuff, and this absolutely works the best. It is the Gorilla Super Glue, but it's the gel kind. Now, it's not the runny super glue that, you know, is like water. This stuff is gel. So when you squirt it, like if I were to squirt it right there, it would stay in place and it won't drip and run everywhere. So that's the stuff we're going to use. And this is the fullest bottle right here. So let me show you guys how to do this. All right, guys, as you can see right here, there's one piece that has started to delaminate right there. 
Um, so let me show you how you correctly reattach that. and it'll, it'll stay there for a very, very long time. Okay, first you definitely want to have a towel um, just to wipe any excess away very quickly. It's very simple, guys. You just pull it away and you get this Gorilla Glue right back behind there. Now make sure you don't get it anywhere on the dash because this stuff will stick and it'll leave a mark. Get a little bit more right in there. Okay, that's plenty behind there. And now we just have to hold it. Now I'm going to push down here. And while I'm doing that, if any squirts out, I'm going to wipe it away real quick. There we go. Oh, and we got to do this piece right here too. So we're going to do both of those. Yep, there you go. See? <laughs> All right. I saw a little bit squirted out right there. And I'll, if you just wipe it real quick, it, it won't leave any residue. You just got to pay attention. And so, guys, I'm going to sit here for literally like a minute holding this because it has to sit. And then we're going to do that piece right there. There we go, guys. That was actually only about 30 seconds. And it has already set. We're good to go there. All right. Now, to get that other piece, we're actually going to open the glove box. And you can go in from the side here. So first, I want to shake my glue down, make sure it's all the way there at the bottom. There we go. We're going to peel that back. And we're going to squirt behind there. Now remember, it's gel, so it's not going to run. That's the trick. All right, now when we push down, again, we want to just watch for any glue to squirt out, and you immediately wipe it away. Okay, got a little bit right there, right there. Perfect. All right. Now we got to hold that for about a minute. And I'm going to go back and just hold both of these pieces just to make sure. And guys, that's not going anywhere. And look, if it detaches, you know, if you see it detached down there, um, that, that happens on a 40-year-old car. Uh, just get some of this glue, and it's very simple. I just showed you how to do it. It takes you, you know, this is going to take me 10 minutes. And uh, this is going to hold for years. This is very common on a, a 300D or any 126, 123, e either one of those cars. There we go, guys. That's done. That is attached. That's not coming loose. That's it. I just wanted to show you guys the rest of the wood in here. I mean, this is just absolutely remarkable. Look at that. That's the most beautiful wood I have ever seen in a 300D. It's clear this car never left the garage. You know what I mean? It was never parked outside, you know? That's just remarkable. But anyway, we have our spots repaired there. Uh, it's not coming to attach over here, over here, over here. We're good. That's it. All right, let's see how close I got it. Bam, perfect. Right between the lines, guys. Okay, guys, a common failure point on these cars is the dimmer switch. So we want to go ahead and test that. I'm going to turn off the light. Okay, let's see if this dimmer switch works. We should get our... Okay, sure enough... That dimmer switch is out in this car, and it is in all of them, guys. And when that happens, um, none of these lights will light up, including your window switch lights. So we need to pop out this gauge cluster. And uh, let me turn on the light in the car. There we go. Turn out the lights. We need to pop out this gauge cluster and uh, change the dimmer switch. And I'll show you guys how to do that. All right, guys, the first thing you want to do on these really nice low mileage cars, uh, you got to get down in here 
And there's the speedometer cable. It is clipped to that little bracket behind the oil filter housing. Um, so we need to get reach down there and unclip that. And then it lets us pull our speedometer cable through the firewall just a little bit to get some slack so we can uh, take out our gauge cluster. So I can't record this, but I'm going to reach down there and unclip that real quick. Okay, what I didn't record just now is I stuck my little, see this little hook right there? You stick them back behind the gauge cluster and then you turn them and you can pull the gauge cluster forward. And I have two of them. There we go. I do it on both sides and we can see the gauge cluster is now loose. I have pulled it out and we can get behind there. And first we need to undo our speedometer cable. It's pretty tight in there, but there we go. That's the slack we were looking for to get access to right there. See, the there's the speedometer cable right there. And that's the slack that we needed. And you can reach behind here now. There we go. Okay, off camera, I just unscrewed the speedometer cable. And then right here, this plug, that's for your tachometer. So we'll just pull that out of there. Now this is your speed sensor right here. That uh, senses your speed and allows or disables the cruise control. So let's see if I can unplug this with one hand. I'll probably have to stop recording to get it out of there. But over here, that's your clock. And then I've already unplugged one bulb. So that bulb right there, that's your glow plugs and you skip one and then it's your seat belt, which is there's the seat belt right there. We unplug that. Then here's the clock. Here is, see if I can record this one. Okay, right there. That's your main power harness. That's a big like 24 pin, pin plug. I don't know how many pins are on it. And then right next to that, right there, you need a 10 millimeter and that's your oil pressure. You just unscrew that. So let me stop recording and get the rest of this out of here. All right, and this is what it looks like when you have it out. So speedometer was right there. Let's see, there's the main harness with like the 20 pins on it. Uh, there's the oil pressure line. Now you definitely do not want to crank the car because oil will come shooting out of there. It's a mechanical gauge. And here's the clock, uh, the two light bulbs. There's the speed sensor. And there's your RPMs, your tachometer. And that's it. So now let's go get this gauge cluster over on the bench. Guys, this is probably the nicest 300D gauge cluster you will ever see. That, there is no sign of wear whatsoever on this cluster. Let me turn off the light. Absolutely remarkable. This is, it's obvious this has never been out of the car because some of the connections on the back were very difficult to get off because they'd never been unplugged before. There you go. Perfect condition. Now, there is our dimmer switch. And those just fail with age. I'll show you why they fail. Let me get that off of here. Um, it's just a Allen, I mean a uh, Phillips head screw right there. And that's it. And then this, you just wiggle it right off of here. And I will show you why they fail. It's like this on just about every car. See that spring right there? There we go. That spring is what causes the resistance. See how it's popped loose? They come unglued. And that's a rheostat that says dim, bright, dim, bright. And they just come loose and pop out, and they're no good after that. And that just happens with age. But you can still get replacements from Mercedes. Here's our replacement right here. Let's see, what's the part number? Oh, here we go. Let's see if that's the same. Yeah. 00054236.25. And they're made by VDO. And they still make them. Now, I don't think they make them anymore for the 126 chassis. But uh, there you go. See the spring in this one? Let's see if I'll focus. See how that spring is still intact? And this can ride on that spring. That's all it is. 
All right, to put it back in, there's two pins right here and two slots here. Now, if you don't have one of these guys, you can just jumper these two pins together and your gauge lights will just always be on. Uh, when you turn on the headlights, they'll always be on and it just bypasses the dimmer switch. Now, to get the dimmer switch in there, you gotta turn the little knob. You gotta make sure it's lined up. There you go. All right. And then you just press it back on there. And I'll verify that it works. Yep. That's lined up correctly. And that's it. Then we just put our screw back in there and put it back in the car. Easy as that, you guys. Let's go put this back in the car. All right, guys. One of the first things I like to do is just go ahead and plug the clock back in. Because uh, I didn't disconnect the battery, and that's a 12-volt supply. And if it, like, touches against something metal, it'll pop your fuse. You have to go change your fuse. So I like to just go ahead and plug that back in immediately so that doesn't happen. Okay, I've got the lights turned out in the shop. Let's go ahead and wait till the overhead light turns out. There we go. All right, I'm going to turn off my lights here. Turn on the headlights. There we go. We already got lights, so that's good. There we go. We now have... A working dimmer switch that's exactly how they should be and also if you look down here we now have all the lights on the center console the air conditioner controls and the window switches and we can actually dim those and brighten those too. see dim and bright here we go guys so that's working perfect now. All right. Now the clock is working perfect uh, on this car. I can actually hear it ticking right now. So nothing we need to do with that. So that's it. And one last thing, we have the fresh hood pad installed. And it looks absolutely fantastic. Well guys, all I gotta do now is uh, go check the oil level. And uh, there's literally nothing else to do on this car it was ball joints wheel bearings and seals sway bar end links uh new ac compressor new ac dryer uh, with switches um, new ball joints new brake hoses and that's about as basic as you can get on a uh on a classic car this thing was just just impeccably cared for so that's it. Hope you enjoyed the video. And uh, next, you guys will see this at Scott's shop. He's going to buff and polish the original paint. And then we'll do the walk around video, and she'll be done. Hope you enjoyed it. See you next time.